Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of This Is Hate City. My name is Jerry Scullion, which I'm sure you know by now. I'm your host and also you probably know by now I'm based in the beautiful city of Dublin, Ireland. Now, today in the show we have Elizabeth Graff, or Lily as she is known by, and we connected a number of months ago, I believe on LinkedIn, and was so impressed by Lily's awesome background and devotion to applying design to enable a greater sense of resilience for both businesses and the planet. Hailing from the beautiful area of Verona in Italy, somewhere I've never been but wanted to go to, Lily is truly on a mission to scale her knowledge, to maximise her impact, not only in her locale of Verona, but also globally through a dedicated community, IMA Collective, now which we talk about in greater detail. Lily, as you will probably get to see, is a wonderful human being and a really, truly genuine example of what I refer to as a change maker. She's taken personal and professional risks to really help enable change. And I believe it is 100% worth connecting with her through whatever medium you want to do, either through our website, which is there's a link in the show notes or the description on YouTube or her LinkedIn. I know you're going to love meeting Lily and hearing about their story. So let's jump straight in. Lily, I'm <laughs> delighted to have you on the podcast. We've been bouncing back and forth about doing an episode. I think it's been a couple of months. Um, but I'm delighted to have you here. So maybe for our guests or for our listeners, should we say, we'll start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, where you're from and what you do. Yeah, so I'm through and through a mountain girl. I grew up on this remote mountain farm in the Italian Alps and to go to school, I would wear a head torch and cross the forest. So, <gasps> so that's, cool. that's my environment. So very close probably to nature and that kept kind of the, mm. the red thread through all my like life, but I was very curious and I did everything that I could to get out of this tiny place. And so cool. I, yeah, I ended up first in Verona because I like to just make my life sometimes a bit more complex. And so from taking all the kind of go to school in German, then I decided to mm. study in Italian from one day to the next. and. And then studied there more like HR and human resources because I couldn't define, I found people fascinating. And but then later on, as I worked on this innovation project uh, founded by the European Union, and we would actually work on circular economy in 2009 or open innovation. Mm. And um, we built a lot of platforms that didn't work and nobody would use them. And so I was like, OK, how can we yeah. make things better? Uh, yeah. What kind of this doesn't work? And so that's when I discovered design and service design. And then I started just kind of teaching myself and trying things out at work, experimenting. And then I thought, OK, I can't really get anywhere with this. And so at a certain point, I just decided to quit my job, go back to university and do a master in service design. Yeah, yeah. And I want to take you back a little bit to the uh, the story you mentioned there about growing up and wearing a headlight going across the forest and stuff. because. When we were chatting earlier, like, you know, your name is German heritage, but you're Italian. And for, for our listeners, it was a kind of a revelation for me because I've always associated where you're from with the language. Lily, we were chatting about the fact that your heritage is German, but you were born in Italy, but you your first language is German. Uh, and your father is Italian and doesn't speak Italian. So what do you feel that this... Um, kind of paradox gives you as a change maker like the fact that um you would have some sort of uh what people might see from the outside as being a bit a, a different identity i think it's nice because you can hold two things at the same time yeah. You can have, have the kind of german structure and organization and italian flexibility and adaptability and I think that many people, there are so many commonalities around people who are growing up at the borders or like where mm. there are the intersections. And then the other thing is growing up in mountains, because yeah. whenever you do something in the mountains, it requires effort. So if you want to just have a nice yeah. time and climb that peak, you probably need to put in quite a bit of effort. So effort comes very easy to any mountain mm. person. Um, for sure there's something on that grid edge kind of piece of where you're you don't hold true to the convention of kind of well I'm Italian so 
uh, you know, I must have a brother called Mario and we must have a pizza shop and a pasta shop, all those stereotypes that we hold true. And it kind of questions the whole kind of our kind of original kind of thinking or initial thoughts around what it means to be something. Um, and it, it allows us to question those probably a lot deeper. Like, you know, do you, is this something you've run into in your professional career where people are like, Oh, you're Italian. And then you're like, well, I'm sort of German as well. Is that something you've faced before? I find it even more because the thing is, I'm not, I'm South Tyrolean, which is even a completely different identity. And was South Tyrolean, we would joke about the German people because <laughs> most we have German tourists and they are very precise and we are a bit more kind of, let's enjoy life. Um, and there yeah. is a certain ethic. So I work, I have clients in that region and it's, mm. uh, I find it very easy to work with them because uh, I grew up in there and then I have you clients all them. over the world. And you truly understand them as well, of course. Yes, and this blend of mix of, of cultures. And it's even so strong because there was a time in which this identity was oppressed. So yeah. if you would look at history of this region more in, mm. in detail, we are actually a region that is studied because it's a one of the best protected minorities in the world. Yeah, And it had a whole history that is super fascinating for some time we were not allowed to speak german it was not allowed to teach oh, really? german and so we had these hidden schools and, mm. oh, okay uh, that's kind of similar to you know our my own culture and my own heritage in ireland so we like head schools so th this is probably going back a couple of generations though is that when when that was the case or it's my grandma, like she speaks Grandmother. better, like she speaks more Italian or spoke more Italian than my, my dad. Nona. And, and yeah, and my granddad was Austrian when he was born. So yeah, ah. he's still part of Austria. I love this. I love this. So it's probably no surprise then when you look at all the factors that um, you've just defined that you found yourself working in the world of service design, but also now more around kind of climate resilience and you know understanding sustainability and circular economy and and all those pieces especially coming from the mountains because it's probably an extension of your yourself in that sense is that true yeah i actually had a conversation and um and somebody said this for your family the work that mm. you do is menacing because people are so like a touch to nature and so close mm. to nature and they can see the um, the impacts of climate change on a daily yeah. basis much more than anybody who lives in the city. I was going to and say, yeah. so you, when I mention what I do, there is usually a silence in the room, um, really? or that makes people feel uncomfortable. And actually, that's one of the things for me has been the major insights because as a designer, I came in and I thought I want to work on climate resilience and climate adaptation, which essentially is about focusing on what are the impacts? So reducing risk and vulnerability. I'm not actually addressing the root cause of the problem, which most traditional uh, sustainability work does around reducing emissions. Mm. I'm actually, and we can't adapt our way out of this, uh, but I just think that if we, when things are breaking down, that's our window of opportunity to redesign them in a new way. And so I'm just preparing mm. for that. But when I came, I thought I would be invited to redesign things or kind of do this transformative adaptation. And then I realized that people actually don't know what adaptation is and why we should care mm. about climate resilience. So I started being much more visible and talking about the topic and talking in a way that is not driven by sci science or kind of makes science accessible. And mm. also it's usually policymakers because it's mostly addressed in the public sector. And mm -hmm. then I realized that actually it's not even the knowledge that people are lacking. It's a bit the kind of the holding space for the grief that comes with recognizing that the world we thought we have built and that stability is no longer there and that we're entering in this age of disruption and discontinuity and what that means yeah. for, for us, for the dreams that we have for our future, for our lives, for our family. And that's so painful that quite many naturally kind of subconsciously consciously avoid thinking about it then yeah. i procrastinated and so i realized actually as a designer i just don't need only to design the responses everything that i do needs to have an opening act 
where mm-hmm. we acknowledge the discomfort that comes with this topic. Yeah. So just going back to your your family, you mentioned there about it being menacing um, and all of those pieces when you speak about what you do and then there's silence. You were referring to your your kind of first family, like your family back in um, in, in Girona, was it? Is that correct? Yeah, no, so it's basically, it's called, yeah, South Tyrol and I'm in this tiny village called Stulles or Stulles and it has like mm. 300 people um, who live there. And That's it huge. Over, it <laughs> overlooks the whole huge. valley, yeah. So we, I'm sure they've been exposed to the change over the last, say, 50 years because there's you know, probably a couple of generations around that table. What are their thoughts as regards everything that's happening around climate change and climate resilience and so forth. So. What, what, what are they seeing? Can you give us an, an, an sort of um, a perspective on, on what's happening in, in their world? So they, they saw different signs. They saw that there is less snow. They saw that mm. so suddenly you could grow, we grow, now grow potatoes at 2000 meters of altitude, like where our mountain hut was. Nothing yeah. would grow there some time ago. And there were, those were tiny things, but what happened over the last two years is suddenly because of more drought, um, you have this bark beetle, which is a beetle that usually it lives in forests, but essentially it is a whole invasion and explosion. And what it means is that you have whole areas of forest that turn brown because the, 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 basically the tree yeah. lives die. And yeah. now they have been cut. And so when you have this landscape in which you start really seeing um, the change and then my brother actually saying to, he was talking with, um, with another person saying, yes, we will see it in our lifetime that there will be no tree left in this valley. And that feels wow. like uh, really losing um, a place. Um, yeah. And so people start to think about, or also if I remember in this last walk that I had with my mom, we she we were talking about water resilience and water scarcity because it's not slowing, so you can't really store. And then I mm-hmm. said, she was like, oh, no, no, I don't want to think about it and talk about it. And I said, no, let's talk about it because, mm-hmm. you know, there have been civilizations in Peru living in areas that, didn't have much water, but what they did is creating a whole canal system in which they just captured water and stored it for longer. So they yeah. adapted and they created those systems. So if we talk, start talking now about this, is is fantastic because we it's can to- we can prepare. And I, what I found fascinating because I'm working with the local government on these issues and and to see how they were starting to realize that this is actually much more systemic and the solution mm. and the processes that they have no longer are fit for purpose. Yeah. Um, but we're still so in the planning stage. And yeah, the it's so scary. Stage. I mean, it really is so scary to think, you know, what it must be like for your parents' generation and your, your Nona's generation to really see that change, to be, to be able to compare. Um, so I know you, you said you, you changed careers in 2021 and you kind of morphed into freelance, um, freelance entrepreneur or a, a, a sort of an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm not too sure how to describe what you do next. Like, so I can understand your origin and the problems that are faced to your immediate family. Um, but what led you to kind of taking the first steps uh, obviously, service design is a great segue into uh, understanding like the systemic uh, implications of our of our actions as designers and change makers. But you formed something that is somewhat um, purpose led, if you want, called the IMA Collective. And it was the bit that when whenever you you emailed a couple of months ago, I was like, actually, this is a really sound proposition from where I'm looking at. Um, so maybe we'll just take a back, a step back and tell us about the IMA Collective and the journey that you took to get there. Yeah. So I think I, so I was working in London in different agencies and it was a mm-hmm. fantastic time to experience and see how service design is applied in so many sectors. And probably like many service designers, you can work from healthcare yeah. to finance to uh, travel. And I was like, okay, 
it's nice to see so many things, but what is actually where do I want to focus? And so for me, that was around sustainability, but then saying I want to work in sustainability is like saying I like sports, but what sport? Is it yeah. running? Is it yoga? Is it uh, football? And so what I did is I already during um, my time in London, I started negotiating and having a four day week so that I could have one day in which I started prototyping freelancing because for me that was a bit my next step but I had no clue yeah. if this was something that I was made for I could do I really would enjoy it and so this was a nice way of kind of dipping my toe into without the risk um, yeah. and also building up a bit of a a network around Italy because I thought if I move back then I need to work with Italian clients and I need to get a good sure. network and yeah. so I started working mostly around the social innovation space um, and, and providing service design trainings and workshops and then with the pandemic suddenly it didn't matter anymore from where I was working so I just moved back to Italy um, mm -hmm. to Sun and Pizza and uh, decided to yeah continue this and then suddenly the work picked up and and my agency decided because it became frog they decided you can't work anymore from abroad so i said okay then i'm just quitting and i'm going yeah. full-time freelancing and the first years of freelancing are a bit like you need to figure out this is actually can i do this and so you you have different jobs that come your way but you have this more reactive version of yeah let me get and i was quite lucky in the sense that I got quite a few projects that I enjoyed because they were more around how do you develop responsible and sustainable AI? How do you create a new value proposition in the fintech space that potentially mm. helps people build financial resilience? And so over time, I realized I wanted to really focus on climate adaptation because suddenly I realized that this is something where where my heart is after having yeah. explored circular economy and many other aspects. And by just every time dipping your toe in, you understand what you like, what you don't like. And yeah. what happened then is that at a certain point, I always defined a bit what is my enough, like how much is my revenue goal? And then I was like, mm -hmm. you actually need to, you have achieved this. You need to do what you said you would do. So Take, I took a sabbatical from client work and I said, okay, now I'm going to just shift my whole practice on climate adaptation and resilience and see what I need to design. And as a designer does, I started having those conversations and interviews with my clients and or potential clients that had a certain design maturity and asking them about where who in the company is actually working on resilience or how do you prepare for the impacts? And they're like, What's that? Why, why should we care about this? And then I thought, okay, let me find the organizations that already work in this field and see mm. what could my role be in that. And they were like, what is service design? And why should we care about design beyond how things look? And I was like, okay, I'm really in this tricky spot. Nobody kind of understands what I could provide. They have no yeah. clear need. So I need to create that need. Well, that takes quite some time. But what I noticed is that everybody in every conversation was asking me, how can I personally prepare for this future? How, what can I do to become more resilient? And I thought, yeah. ah, people want to understand what, how they, like on an individual level, before they can do the big thing. And then I yeah. started analyzing what, what are all the elements that would make a personal life more resilient. And so... What can you do with your finances? What can you do where you live? What can you do with work, your relationships, community? And I understood that the number one key factor was how you make a living. And that actually mm. working for yourself would give you the agency to decide from when you work, what you do, where you do it, um, how. Yeah. And that working for yourself is one of the most resilient options. And yet we see it as one of the most uncertain options. Yeah, And so this contradiction was fascinating that tension between yeah. what we're sort of sold as teenagers and in university like you know go get a job um having that question you know linger over your head as a 30 year old and a 40 year old is kind of a little bit more daunting you're like what what do you mean but you know it's i don't know if it's a path for everyone 
but um and i can obviously speak from my own perspective it's given me the opportunity and the agency i love it when people say that word agency to make those decisions and to kind of explore and experiment but there was a line in your email that i remember reading and i was like actually you know what this is this makes total sense to me and i'm going to read it out here um as a result, I founded IMA Collective, a community of solopreneurs focused on climate and social impact because building a solo business together is the most resilient career choice. And that there is is a really powerful statement and something that I've learned over the last decade or so that um, working with people and understanding people and trying to build a business together, it's very difficult. Um, it, they don't always work. Um, so tell us a little bit more around the purpose behind Emma Collective. Um, I know you want to bring people together to get great social outcomes. Uh, um, but tell us how it operates. Tell us, you yeah. know, what the value is for people who've got maybe a social impact initiative that they want to get involved and join the community. Yeah. So exactly as you mentioned, there is one part around where people we de- never learn how to work for ourselves because mm-hmm. either university prepares you for, to be an employee and then you have accelerators who want to build the next unicorn and there is nothing in between for people who want to stay relatively nimble and small. And you also think you need to figure everything out on your own. And I thought, yeah. I want to actually help people do this, but I want to do it only for people who want to do work in climate and social impact and actually mm-hmm. use their work to transform And so by bringing people together, essentially in IMA, I create a space to connect and to get that support, but also to get the the structure, sometimes even through rituals, to help you work Mm -hmm. and create the space to work on things that are usually important, but not urgent. Because when you work for yourself, you don't have a boss, you have just self-imposed deadlines. And usually you could be in this more reactive approach in which just ah let me get the next client and then do the thing and then not think about what are really the things that are important that are the solid foundations that you need to build this up in a resilient way and so i just create the space for people usually there is every event has a kind of core elements there is the part around self-reflection so giving people prompts to really focus on the business and, yeah. and what is important to them and sometimes, for example, what also led me to be having this conversation with you was like, mm. okay, if, if your goal was to get three rejections, what would you dare to try? And and mm. then I asked them, and that pushes people to actually make more progress. That pushed me to say, ah, except in, I'm not waiting around for opportunities. I could actually go out and seek them. Yeah. And the other thing is um, what I also do within IMA is, hard part is finding opportunities because most of the work comes from personal connections so if you don't have a good network you might don't find those opportunities because usually they are hidden and so what i do is essentially we go on more than 100 job boards uh, that are focused on climate and social impacts and i pick out all the freelance opportunities or really help people to connect and get those opportunities and the referrals and the introductions Mm. that are necessary to find work and then, of nice. course, there is all the other aspects of helping people to, yeah, understand how do you deal with finances? How do you deal with you know, visibility, marketing and sales? Like suddenly as an entrepreneur, if you if you are your business, you have so many more hats to wear. Yeah. You can't be covered by everything and you can't somehow up, like, upskill very quickly. You can do it by trial and error and Emma just kind of, helps you shortcut that trial and error thing because you do it together with others. And yeah. also, I believe it's not, there is quite a lot of people who teach you how to freelance, but I don't believe in the one size fits all element. There is no one recipe. Everybody needs to figure out what works for them in their context, in their environment. Because maybe, you know, to come back also from my origin, when I'm dealing with Italian clients, I know I need to take them out for lunch we need to have we need to have a meal together before we can do business when i'm speaking to clients in the us it's all about what is your problem how can i help us solve it yes let's get to work 
it's a completely different also mindset of how yeah. how you need to develop those relationships. I'm I'm on the website here at the moment, scrolling at the same time, and like there's the whole piece around the seed piece, um, where you, you pay 450 euros a year and you get a, a year access to the community, and presumably there's probably things for them to learn in there to kind of get stress tested on uncertain perspectives on their their business models. Um, well, what else do they get for the 450 euro? I think a lot of templates and the kind of guidance on gaining more clarity around what is your offering, mm. because that is the hardest part uh, often to figure that out. Because when you start out, and especially as a service-based business, you could do yeah. so many things. There's just the, the sheer overwhelm of choice, which makes it so hard. And especially for people who have been working for companies a long time in a long time, um, they might have even had certain positions in which they had a certain leadership and seniority and maybe a lot of your responsibility was around stakeholder management and that part and you have lost a bit the craft so you need yeah. to really kind of re re-understand is what do i actually offer am i going to mm. be a practitioner who sells a specific craft am i actually going to address a specific problems and i become the expert of solving that problem and what yeah. from all the problems that i could do could that be um, so it is, um, an incredibly powerful moment. And if you do that in a very conscious way and a structured way, mm. you can find the answers more quickly. I personally did more sometimes trial and error, and then I developed things that I thought I should offer. But when you offer something that is not aligned with truly who you are and what you believe mm. in, it's going to be incredibly hard to sell that. Yeah. You don't want to show up. You don't want to promote it because it doesn't feel right and aligned with you because mm. it's not. And and I also found that with Emma, it took me a long time to really figure out what it is that I wanted to build and how it would be set up because. Sure. Um, and it's in constant e evolution because. Absolutely. It's also bringing people together and understanding what is it that they need? What is kind yeah. of really. The same with this as ACD, like we're always kind of monitoring it. And seeing where, where the opportunities are, like, you know, one of the pieces that I guess for the success of IMA to, to continue to grow is looking for designers and change makers out there to take that first step. Um, so what do you say to those designers who are kind of um, trying to understand the implications of taking that first step and what it means to the perceived safety net of a full time job or um, even a part-time job, what does that look like um, from somebody who's already established? What advice do you give to them? I usually would say take advantage from when you're, when you're still in that position of a job mm. and really figure out a way of how you could prototype and start exploring what you want to focus on, what you want to build up. So it's about yeah. building up your network um, and connections even when you are in a job and sometimes actually if you have a certain privileged position it's so much better if you do it if you're still in a job because people will talk to you because you have a certain brand name once you start out on yeah. your own you lose that name yeah. um, and you need to build up yours from scratch and then yeah. it's about getting clear like what could you potentially offer as well as putting the money aside so that you have that call it like a freedom fund that mm -hmm. allows you to when you take that leap to not feel under pressure to absolutely make money because having money put aside is the best negotiation tool you could just walk away from a project um, yeah that doesn't align with what you truly want to do and it doesn't put you in such a scarcity mindset that it's really hard and you might no to totally not enjoy um, that leap because even if I had I who had prepared everything very kind of no probably I'm I'm relatively a risk adverse person so I set myself up probably for success I trial it out for two year, few years before I take the leap but I remember in that period I just had such an existential fear and that I would just wake up in the morning um, because suddenly you lose all that structure that the security of a job has given you for years. And yeah. I remember I didn't have my period for a few months 
I mean, that level of just stress where your stress. body says, like, I just kind of try to preserve myself right now. Um, yeah. So. It's it, it, like, it is a really, really stressful time for everyone. And there are like, you know, highs and lows and peaks and drops or however, however you want to say it when you work for yourself. Um, but you're right. It does take, it takes a perseverance and a resilience to, to keep going. Like there's been times where I'm like, oh, it must be easier just to work for, um, <laughs> work for a business, but there's pros and cons to I, both sides of it. And overall, I think what works for me is the, um, is just the ability to, to choose and build something that I have ownership of. Um, just going into the IMA collective piece a little bit more. So can you give me an example of say some of the the kinds of businesses that you're helping to work with? Um, just so people can maybe self-identify and say, well, that's like, that's actually me. You know, that, that could be, that could be me. Cause I, I really want to stress like, you know, I've got no affiliation to IMA collective. I just want to promote it. Cause it sounds like it's a really purpose-led organization um lily's awesome as you can potentially hear here but i just would love to you know kind of support it in any way that i can so maybe just tell us a little bit about you know what what they can look like and what yeah. are the kind of things that you do with them so you can have different versions I, I i see there are some people who come in for example sophie she runs a communication agency and yeah she then just focus that specifically on organizations that are purpose-led then mm. Janina, she's just a charity consultant. She really helps charities set up things in, in a specific way. And then mm. you have people who are actually much more going into future needs and future problems, like Camille, who just launched recently her closure hotline because she wants to be, and she defines her herself as a, line, is said? As a clo conscious closure consultant. Because closure in consultant. this wor world in which we go through a transition, we need to close down things. Oh. And she helps organizations end kind of programs, initiatives, organizations. Yeah. And then you have, for example, Tess, who does another thing that is amazing, I find, and so probably needed. She works on fluid leadership because you usually have this binary thinking, but actually we need to go beyond the yeah. usual binary way. And how do you, what does fluid leadership look like in a culture? How do you actually bring that to an organization? Yeah. And, and so they there all... are some people who really work on the forefront of things that people don't know yet that are needed, but are emerging um, mm. and others who are, taking their skills that they have and just applying it very specifically to a certain sector and their, their needs. And so, yeah. So that's, is there a case there for like, you know, you mentioned Tess and a few other people um, that they, they don't look to you for the answers. They, they look to the community for answers. So is that the kind of proposition? It's, it's less around, um, you know, you, you being up here and then if you've got a question, you go to, go to Lily. Yeah um is that kind of the is that one of the metrics of success for you i guess in terms of building the network where people can go to each other and and kind of serve each other yeah i called it emma collective and i just just generally i knew that i needed to be visible to start it so that people could believe in it but i yeah. don't have i don't pretend to know the answers the only i see myself as the kind of the the coordinator the weaver and I've described in my collective often as we are like a community garden. Everybody has their own plot of garden yeah. and there are different things that grow in your plot than in mine. But the fact yeah. that we actually do that in a shared space allows us to share advice. We can share seedlings. We can have sometimes a garden party together. Um, also, because working for yourself, is often we think it's a very alone venture where mm. you're you don't have much of the, the the community space, even just kind of recognize that other people are going through the same issues as you. Yeah. And so um, creating those occasions to connect, but everybody still kind of has that independence. And this is sometimes also a bit the, the hard part around Emma. I'm doing something that is very collective for people mm -hmm. who have chosen independence. Okay. But it's not like a Y Combinator 
kind of seed venture where there's an equity, um, you know, there's some sort of acquisition happening in the background where Lily is like, sure, I can help you, but uh, I want to get a 2% equity in your social impact business. You know, it's none of that. No. So it is really autonomous in terms of um, it is a community for social impact and um, solopreneurs, really. Oh, yes. And um, what I'm trying to figure out is how can IMA become truly a regenerative business model in yeah. the sense that I would love for people to be able cool. to make a living thanks to and through IMA. And I have a yeah. bit of a vision for that. But I think it's always also recognizing where did I start? And for now, like it felt like last year's like me just investing lots of time and resources in something that I believed and slowly it's mm. taking form. And you can see also people um, emerging and in every monthly kickoff session that we have, I always create an interactive exercise for people to ha ask how let's design this together. What is your favorite day? What is, uh, what is the topic you want to talk about next? It's like, okay, how can I create this in a co-creative way? Yeah. And I really that it also me always thinking about resilience right now, it's mostly online and sometimes we have events in big cities like berlin london milan um but in the future i would love to have this also more localized so that people could physically meet in a place and that it is truly resilient because right now yeah. just unplug the thing and it's gone um so how can Emma live without electricity is the typical question that yeah. me, as a designer who works on climate resilience thinks about and I know. starts keeping in mind right now, even if it's maybe not necessary, but that's my, my way of thinking even about this community. It's kind of counterintuitive in some ways. You're like, the, the more you grow, the more energy and electricity you're using, which most likely is coming from fossil um reserves so um it's yeah it's, it's a quandary all right like um what what are the metrics of success then for you like in terms of um you say you imagine to do in a collective for the next decade it's been going a couple of years two or three years already is that right no actually it's like one year and if you think the community in itself i just launched it what beginning of january like that i had oh, it was 2021 you transitioned yeah that's what it was you went freelance so you've been doing this for a year yeah, um, and also um, not creating without the space because now I have like what those th 30 founding members and we're just starting to create it. But again, it's uh, I, I started when we kicked it off. I asked them to help me define the measures of success. So I asked them, how do you want to feel in this? And so yeah. what came out is the people want to feel supported. And so every month I asked them, how supported do you feel? But also how much support have you given others? Because support is a mm, way of oh, connection. 100% there's a connection between the two. So you do you do an online kind of event every month with the people who are members. Is that right? So it's it's run on Circle as a platform, so a community mm -hmm. platform, and there are different monthly rituals. So it starts by kicking off your month and planning the month ahead. Then you have a networking session in the middle of the month that is open to everybody who is curious about, just again to expand that network. Everyone outside like, of the membership or just people within the membership? Nope, also people who are outside who are curious oh, okay. um, and they can meet the people within the community. We have now just started... Um, weekly procrastination power hours because people just loved the the idea of having a space where they have more accountability mm. and then are like we have a session where we talk about finances and pricing and those type of issues yeah. and or finding clients how do you go about that and share how everybody approaches it in different ways very nice and then there is always the monthly end of the month reflection because when you work for yourself you never really get a pat on the shoulder. So this is actually for you to look back of what have you done during the month? What is the, um, the progress you made, but also what had the biggest impact and to be very intentional in how you do things. Yeah. And what I've been running that session for the last year for free for everybody. And you could see like, ah, oh, that really, at least also for me, but also for others, it changes so much over time. I just believe in the power of small rituals. Um, mm -hmm. rather than one big thing that shifts everything yeah absolutely um so it sounds like you've kind of hit a, a sort of a period in your life where everything is kind of starting to connect in some ways how would you how would you score yourself in terms of five being like 
completely purpose led at the moment. I've, I've I've met my kind of purpose. I've made my purpose a reality, and one being like mm, not nowhere near it. Where would you say you're at at the moment? I'm five totally. Oh I really? Think. Yes. Straight out of the gate, there was no pausing there. You heard that, folks? Five out of five. Okay, right. So I feel it's. <laughs> I feel this is more a vocation than it actually is a job. I feel so that you- I. Ha- it, I feel Can you sustain yourself though do, doing the, the community? Because this is the big thing. I know we want to talk about being purpose led and making sure that we're kind of aligned to our values. But is this something that you could see yourself doing and earning a living from? Um, and you mentioned something in our pre call about being just enough. And it's something that um, it is a mind shift for a lot of people. But is this something that you, you think you can grow into a sustainable um, model to sustain your life? Yes, I was I was applying for a program last week. And so I was basically mm. looking at the commercial model and I'm not the perfect person and so and so I think what I realized is yeah. and also looking I wrote my vision and then my vision was bigger than I actually kind of had in mind on the others. And so it kind of re I made me realize is do I wanna just build this in something that works well for me, that is relatively small and it can sustain yeah. me and my life. And it's like, okay. I, I cap it and that is it. Or do I actually want to go full in on how can I impact more people? How can this potentially be scalable? And then for me, I have in my mind, it's like there is even this form node. You have usually nonprofit business or, yeah. and then you have for profit. And there is one thing in between where you have what some call or Jennifer Hinton calls it not for profit business. It's yeah, businesses yeah. that reinvest in their purpose and in their mission so i think sometimes about myself it's okay what is the enough and above that how can this actually give back because then that is a truly regenerative business and it sounds something idealistic and sometimes there is the part of me that is grown up and has this inner capitalist that is like what the hell how could you do that because you invested so much money you gave up on so many things to just build this and take it out of the thing yeah and then there is the other part of me saying hey, you actually want to change things, you truly need to do that differently and you need to reevaluate how things are. And I think those both things can currently also coexist and it's normal that they are in conflict. And I just, I know that also things will evolve over time. Hmm. And I've been speaking with some people who invest in regenerative business because Mm -hmm. I couldn't apply for normal VC funding because it's just against the logics that I want. Oh, yeah. But I realized that also on that front, everybody's just trying to figure it out. There is no playbook. Um, yeah, there is nothing. It is following your heart and following your your kind of instinct and in some yeah. of this stuff. Um, so what's next then for the next uh, 12 months, 18 months for, for you, Lily, and, you know, with Emma Collective, like what, what's on the horizon and what can people expect? So for now, what I've been doing is I still kept my consultancy practice at the side so that Mm -hmm. I have that financial income to some extent so that I don't need to put Emma under pressure to need to hit the numbers. Because for me, it was important to have to grow it more on quality and rather sometimes I'm I'm not pushing as much or not trying to sell as much because I rather have a good group of people who connect really well and to yeah. really figure things out and to not be under that, ah, I need to sell to make this work. I didn't want to have that. I know sure. that will happen at a certain point. Yeah. And so right now, I think it, it starts to be a bit harder to manage both things in terms of time-wise, but it's a constant yeah. readjusting. And then I think I still... Because actually Emma is so tied and connected to climate resilience, I thought I need still to be advised on climate resilience. And I have a couple of projects, but it's all Mm. so very diverse. So it goes from focusing on local government to exploring how a resilient organization is structured. And it's also this nice part that probably many service designers have that I have is Mm. I'm a curious person. I just love um, exploring new things. Curiosity is at the heart of... I think 99.9% of the service designers that I've worked and trained with. Um, and you definitely have that in spades. Um, I noticed on your website, there's a, a newsletter. People can sign up and stay, stay across what you're doing and how you're doing it and when you're doing it. So maybe we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well as a link to, to Emma collective. 
But if there's anything else people want to ask you, um, Lily, what's the best way for them to do it and get in touch with you? Yeah, usually I'm very active on LinkedIn, so people can yeah. just reach out. That is my pay- space. And then usually I also run those sessions of like Explore Emma, where I just kind of give people together and they nice. can do it. Because I also think that it's not I'm just one person, but there is you need to see like who are the other people who show up. Do you want to spend time with them? Uh, yeah. And I think that's a bit the 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 way of how I want to do it. I just, this is not about me. This is more about the community and the people you find there. Absolutely. Look, Lily, I, I can't believe it's taken us so long to, to connect. Like every time I speak to someone on the podcast, I feel like I know them really well at the end of a, a quick chat. Um, so I finish every episode and this is HC by thanking them for coming on and, you know, being vulnerable enough to allow me to probe and ask questions that, you know, they're not prepared, folks. We don't do um, a scripted interview on this aside city, as you've probably become aware of at this stage. But really, look, just thanks for, for coming on and, and sharing the story. And I wish you every success with Emma Collective. It sounds amazing. Um, folks, do check it out. Like, you know, show Lily some support. You might know people who are interested in this space. Send the link on to them um, because it'd be great to see this really take off and provide uh, everyone with the kind of frameworks that Lydia's been working on. So kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the work that you do in kind of sharing ideas out into this world. Oh, listen, it's it's always enjoyable, especially when I get to speak to pe- people like you, Lily. Thanks. Really appreciate it. <laughs>